In the good old days, this was the key ingredient for a grade school student, the good old-fashioned lesson book. But nowadays, you're just as likely to find a student carrying around one of these, for computers have invaded our schools. Today, we're going to begin a special two-part look at educational software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chiffe, and this is George Morrow sitting in this week for Gary Kildall. George, I'll bet you're wondering what this little frog here has to do with educational software. Oh, I'll bite. <laughs> well, when I was in high school studying anatomy in biology, we had to take a poor frog like this and mm -hmm. kill it and slit him down the middle and look at all the organs that were inside him. Nowadays, I can do that with software. With this is something called Operation Frog, for example. I can use my cursor and grab the forceps or magnifying glass or scissors. I have my examination tray over here. I can ask for help as to what organ I ought to be taking out next, and that's the liver. Mm -hmm. Now, some critics, though, would say this is kind of a nifty good old trick, but really, educationally, it is no substitute for the real thing. What do you think? I, I disagree with that. I think it's a marvelous tool as a supplement. First of all, it's great for run-throughs. Second of all, it's a good reference tool to have with you as you're actually doing it. So I'd have to disagree with that. So it's not bad to supplement what you might do with, with the real frog. On today's program, we're going to look at the use of computers in the classroom. We'll have school teachers and principals and educational software publishers here to talk about the current use of educational software, and we'll take a look at some nifty demonstrations of new educational software products. First of all, we're going to go to something called the classroom of the future here in the Silicon Valley, where every student has a computer in the classroom and at home. At the Stevens Creek School in Cupertino, California, a research project is underway that could transform the role of computers in classrooms. Apple Computer has provided enough hardware so that each individual student will have a computer both at school and at home. In their oversized classroom, these third graders spend some of their time learning about how computers work and how to use them. They also practice math drills and game-like exercises. But the similarity with the usual school computer lab ends there. The object of Apple's Classroom of Tomorrow is to make computers a part of everyday school activity, another tool that is always present like a pencil or a blackboard. By integrating computers seamlessly into the daily routine, the project's directors hope to profit from the individual dialogue between student and machine, an interaction that puts the focus of learning on the student. Youngsters move directly into more powerful applications, like word processing, as a first step towards self-motivated work. The Long Range Cupertino project is one of seven demonstration sites around the country and involves rural and city schools from third grade to ninth grade. Who thinks they can spell koala? That's toughy. Christelle? Because of the project's unprecedented approach, teachers will depend on trial and practice to decide how to fit their new hardware into the curriculum. Finally, the school hopes to discover how to bridge the gap between the blackboard and the keyboard. Joining us now in the studio is Mark Batty. Mark is product manager for electronic publishing at Addison Wesley. And next to Mark is Barbara Calajuri, special projects coordinator for the Cupertino Union School District here in the Silicon Valley. Barbara, I'd like to start with you and ask you in general about the field of educational software. Uh, are adequate resources, you think, going into this area? Is educational software kind of a stepchild of the rest of the industry? Yes, however, the perspective is changing considerably. Uh, the state of California and other educational networks have ask a lot of questions about software and they're paying more attention now 
developing better software, more adequate software, meeting our curriculum needs. So it's coming along. Resources are always scarce, but um, that will happen too. As better software becomes available, people will be willing to spend more money. Barbara, you've got a, you're in the middle of a real heavy resource, rich technical resource. Are you getting a lot of support from the companies in the area? To a certain extent, yes. They're very interested in putting things into the classroom to see how it works and to find out what will work better and where we can go from there. But at the same time, the educational market is not as big a market or as appealing a market as the educational market in the home. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Mark, you're, you're a seller, if you will. Barbara, you're a buyer. How about from Addison Wesley from a publisher's point of view? How important do you think this educational software market is? Well, educational software is very important to Addison Wesley. We are, as you may know, a full-scale educational materials publisher, and we are approaching software in that realm. How does it fit in with textbooks? How does it fit in with video? How does it fit in with other technologies? In that realm, we're very excited about technology and helping the entire educational process. And is it a good market? I mean, are there a lot of people out there, schools, who are interested in buying educational software and incorporating that? It is a growing market. It certainly doesn't pay all the bills today in, uh, for a textbook publisher like Addison Wesley, but it's one in which we see growth, we see tremendous excitement by teachers and interesting learners. Mark, uh, the skills of editing and selecting books is something that's been going on a long time in the paper publishing. Where do you think the state of that is in the electronic publishing of software? Well, I think it's improving. I can say that we don't uh, treat software any differently in terms of the edit editorial process. All of the materials that come through Addison Wesley go through a, a very detailed review process with users, with our beta test sites, with internal designers. Uh, so in that case, we try to match any quality standards we have with print along with software. Now, Mark, you've got something here called Inf Information Laboratory, I think, and show us this piece of software. This uh, software, Information Laboratory for Life Science, is a knowledge base designed to let students practice critical thinking and problem solving skills while learning more about a particular content area, life science. Student can get into the knowledge base in a number of ways. One way is to go in through major subject areas. Let's say the student wants to learn more about the animal kingdom. They will select that from the menu and a series of information comes up related to the deck, Animal Kingdom. The cards in each of the decks are organized the following way. On the left, you have text and sometimes graphics. On the right, you have a series of keywords and cross-references that are related to uh, the concept. Student can go in and learn more about specific areas. Let's say they want to learn more about the animal cell. First, they can pick up and read the individual card. If they want to learn more about levels underneath the cell, they can go and make a deck of it. This is now bringing up all the information, not just related to animal kingdom, but specifically related to animal cell. So the student on his or her own can, can individually branch farther down into the That's database right. depending on where the interest is. The goal of all this is to provide students with the ability to make their own personal information database as they keep going. What, what grade level would this be used at? This Mark? is designed for uh, middle school level, grades 7 through 9. Let's say a student wants to learn more about blood. They will go in and read information about that, again branching into new areas if they like. Here again, you can go down to another level. Let's say I want to learn more about uh, uh, tissue here. Mm -hmm. I will go and make a deck of that. That's the basic interaction. There are a number of features that they can manipulate the information. Now, is this designed for the student to use by himself or along with a teacher and a book? How, how is this used? Well, there, there are two prime roles. One, we provide a lot of teacher support materials and teacher guides and a series of structured searches, we call search sheets, that a teacher can give to a student and say, here's, mm -hmm. uh, compare these and contrast. The kind of experience I went through is more of a unstructured browsing. I think the software works equally well. Okay, Mark, if I could ask you to slide the computer keyboard over to Barbara here, because I want her to load up Reader Rabbit. And while she's doing that, I want to ask you another question. It's kind of interesting, uh, George, you were mentioning the Addison Wesley background in print mm -hmm. and how you use the print analogy in the software with the cards and the decks and so on. I take it that's on purpose? Well, it's on purpose because that's the way information can be structured well. Three, excuse me. Um, yeah. We don't try, we certainly try not to replicate anything uh, specifically in a textbook onto the software, with the exception of the type of objectives. The objectives in life science 
teaching critical thinking, teaching concepts are the same. Do you think there's enough room on these floppies to get as much information as you need, or are you going to... We have squeezed as much room as we can. <laughs> How, what do you think about this uh, CD-ROM possibility? This particular type of application, I think, will go straight into a CD-ROM application. You'll get better graphics, you'll get, bo get more information. Barbara, let's go from middle school level to grade school level, yes. or even kindergarten, perhaps, and tell us about the Reader Rabbit program. In the Reader Rabbit program, we're primarily concerned with beginning sounds or beginning letters so that a student with a background of, say, half the alphabet can start to improve their skills and match. Is um, this first grade, for example? Or? First grade, it could be used at kindergarten, and it could be used as a remedial program in second or third grade, depending on the child's skill level. Okay, give us an example. All right. In the particular format here, for example, we have four different kinds of games. And one convenient thing that they've done for us in the schoolroom, you can turn the sound off because, as you know, if you had all of this going on, it right. would be a little noisy. Right. But if you want to hear the regular program, we'll leave the sound on now. We'll go down to the, um, the third game. They increase in difficulty. And in this particular game, Word Train, it's a way of discriminating letters and looking for just one letter change from the original. You'll see on the engine, we have the word gap. And we want to find another word which is very close to that, which varies only by one letter. Okay. And so as Can we I look guess? across, guess. Be guess, G A S? G A S. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to move across and see if you're right. Oops. Okay, so the student right. would select that and that's correct because it got a lot of And when it's correct, training. you get a little bit of an incentive. Okay. And you would pick the next one. Let's sort of see what happens at the end here. All right, if we want to go over and. Um, match it again. I'm pretty quick at my first grade stuff. I'll take that one. You'll take that one? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's try that one. Okay. All right, we're filling it up fast. What about the third one? Who'd like uh, to choose that one? George, go ahead. I guess it'd be guess. All right, then we're going to have to move over and choose. Just graduated from first grade, George. Very this software good. is designed for both use in the home and in the school? Yes, a parent could take this at home, for example, and work with their child in recognition of letters and in a concentration game, which is one of the uh, more advanced parts of it. Or uh, they could do some review type things, mm -hmm. or a brother and sister could play with one another on this as a kind of an educational game. What are the, I'm kind of interested in what kind of criteria do you have to see whether this software has done its job or not? Well, of course, if it has, they're going to look for more complicated games. They're going to want to move faster, and their speeds I mean, so that are, you can move it are, up. These are word skills here, mm -hmm. and, and it would seem to me like it would be important to have something to be able to, to measure whether this thing is actually helping children. Something uh, maybe like a placebo arrangement where some of them have it and some of them don't, so that you have some criteria about whether this is really useful uh, activity, because this isn't cheap. This is a lot more expensive than books. Yes, but on the other hand, there's an excitement factor that goes along mm -hmm. with the child being able to do this and to get instant reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll find that if they leave this very quickly or they get fidgety or bored and they don't want to do it any longer, it's usually an indication that they're not having much mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. Barbara, but, we're, out of, we're out of time right, right now for this segment. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're <laughs> yes. going to go from now grade school, middle school to high school, where we'll see the use of computers and a mini CAD system to teach technical students about drafting skills. Wendy Woods has that report. Everyone who remembers shop class remembers drafting. But high school drafting classes never used to look like this. This is Burlingame High School, one of the few in the country offering computer-aided drafting to students. By 1990, it's been estimated there will be 2.1 million jobs in the computer-aided drafting field. And these students are among the few who will be prepared virtually out of high school. There's a revolution going on in this industry and right now, the need uh, is identified. The exact numbers we're not sure of, but we've been told that we're not putting out enough of these operators. So this is so new that as industry gets this, hopefully the educational facilities will be able to supply the numbers that they need. In this school, students must still master the basics of drafting using pencil, paper, and slide rule before they graduate to the computer. But then the micro-based system, complete with a digitizer pad for drawing, allows them to create, modify, erase, and make hard copy of their illustrations faster and easier than by hand. The students won't be limited to Apples and IBMs once they graduate. They may go on to work on far more sophisticated systems. But at least here, they're learning the concepts and the basics of computer-aided drafting, which will be invaluable experience for them as they progress in their careers.
For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods in Burlingame, California. Joining us now in the studio is Dr. Mickey Miller, Assistant Principal at a San Francisco Middle School, and also Donna Hauer, a computer specialist at Crocker Middle School in Burlingame, California. And uh, George Donna's just flown in from Fiji to be here on the show, and we appreciate That's that. That's great. Yeah. Mickey, I want to start with you. Up until, now, up until now, we've been talking about some sort of upper socio-demographic schools here in the Silicon Valley and so on. You work in a middle school in San Francisco with a high minority population, as I understand it. How, how is, what's the difference here in the use of computers in that kind of school? Well, in our school, um, we have two computer labs. We have one computer lab that was purchased through uh, federal funding, and that was specifically for the low um, socioeconomic students that had low grade test scores. Uh, when I came to the school three years ago, I realized that 80% of our population were using these computers, but 20% couldn't because their scores were too high. So I started writing grants to get computers that those 20% um, could use. Um, because of the computers that we're using, the computer assisted instruction, our test scores are going up mm -hmm. and less students are able to use those computers, which are TRS-80s, and so now we have 50% of our population that we want to get in to use the Apple computers. So the computers are helpful at the remedial end and in, in, in that kind of school? In our well, school the they have been very helpful in the remedial end. Like I say, we had maybe 80% of our students that were using them and, and their scores have gone up and now it's 50%, so that's accountability, I think. So the students are actually becoming more computer literate. They're moving up. Well, computer-assisted instruction doesn't really make you computer literate. It's a lot of drill and practice. I see. But it um, helps the students get a one-to-one, -one, even though it's not one person to one person. It's at least the computer that's giving them some feedback on I a see. constant Mickey, basis. Mickey, you brought along Voyage of the Mimi here, and right. show us uh, what this program does. Okay. Well, Voyage of the Mimi is a, um, a multimedia kind of. A, uh, computer package and um, this particular lesson is an ecology lesson which teaches the students about survival. So they have to start out looking at a food chain and they're going to be um, on a desert island for 12 months. Okay, so they've seen some videotapes before they've they get to this point. They've seen videotapes, right. Okay, and, and what do they do now? Okay, now they have to decide what they're going to eat for 12 months and they have to constantly replenish their source of, of food. Um, here we have the possibility of choosing any of these animals and so the first one I think we would like to choose would be the bear. Okay, and, okay. and you're saying you're, you can eat the bear on this island you've Right. But it looks like we need now to feed the bear. We have to feed the bear, and if I want to know how to feed the bear, I can ask the computer what is it that the bear eats. Uh -huh. And this will tell me that um, it could eat, say, a rabbit, so we'll go back and we'll try to choose our rabbit. Um, so you're building up the whole ecology chain here. The bear will eat the rabbit, the human will eat the bear. Right, but the poor rabbit it needs something so to eat too. So I'll go down and I'll give the rabbit some grass. Okay. And then I could go over and I could give the rabbit some berries. Okay. Okay. So if you set up the chain now? It's not quite complete yet. Okay. Okay. The rabbit needs more than just grass, is That's what you're right. saying. That's right, yeah. And you're having trouble getting the blueberries and there. I, there's the blueberries. Okay. Okay, now this whole system is complete, and it asks me if I'm sure this is what I want, and I tell it yes, and now it wants me to do the same thing with the fish. Okay, so I would have to have fish and go to something that the fish can eat, and then something. Okay, I'm going to ask you to keep Playing Doing that a minute, and I want to okay. talk to Donna for okay. just a second. Okay, now Donna, you're working at a kind of high-class school here in Hillsborough, a very wealthy community. Yeah. How are you using computers there? Well, we're using computers in a lot of ways in Hillsborough. We started back in 1977 with a TRS-80 lab, and on the opposite side of the coin, we got ours because of gifted. We have a high number of gifted children, and we used our gifted money and focused it all into one big lab. And since then, we have organized an Apple lab through grants and money the students have earned and that sort of thing. And so we have an Apple lab with 15 computers, a TRS-80 lab with 17, and about eight or nine of the teachers have computers in their classroom, so those who would like to use them. We use them for word processing, the English teachers, a lot of creative writing and interaction in that. The uh, social science teachers use it when they're writing term papers for not only writing but database accessing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I, wanna, I think we're about to see something okay. happen now back to Mickey's island here. What's happening? Okay, on my island here I have now three survivors and I have to give them a name. So I'll give Donna one name and I'll give it my name. Okay. And I'll give it one more name. Whoop. 
Okay, that's a good name. <laughs> it's an island, you know. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm okay. I'm happy with this. Okay. okay, and now what do you do? Now I have to say what I want each of these people to do. I'm going to have Donna go fishing. I'm going to have me go fishing. Uh, she's going hunting. Okay. I'm going fishing, and I'll have the other person fish, too. Okay. And if I'm happy with these activities, I tell it yes. Okay, and now it actually shows you the people running around the island looking for it food? It will. I, if I press return now, he'll well, come ahead. across here, and he will begin by... Uh -huh. well, it looks like hunting. the food supply is going down. It takes him energy, food? right. It right. takes him energy to try to find the food. Okay, now, he is represented by this little dot, and I'm going to zoom him up to a place I know that is dense with food. And, and there are animal tracks he's passing there? He, he the is island, passing huh? those, but it's easier if I get them inside this dense area. Yeah. So I've got him in there, and I'm going to walk him up, and I know that this is an animal right here, and so I will get over to the animal. It's a rabbit. a rabbit. I want Great. it. Okay, Mickey, I'm going to ask you to slide the computer over to Don, and if you can reload this, I want to take a look at that factory program you have there, Don. This a is second. an example of something that would be awfully hard to do without having something as uh, good at manipulating data as a computer. That's is. for sure. Uh, Mickey, I want to ask you, George got into this a, a couple minutes ago. How do you go about evaluating this software and determining what to buy, number one, and whether it's any good uh, if you do buy it? Okay, because we're just being plunged into a, a plethora of software, um, we look at it, we get it on approval, we call our friends, we talk to the tech center that evaluates uh, software in our own city, and then we go on, on their suggestions and just what, this came very highly recommended and so we did go with it. It's very expensive, however. It is. It is. So you don't have a, a it's sort of a guessing That's right. at this point. That's right. Donna, you picked the factory to show us. Tell us what that does and what that teaches. Factory is a problem-solving program, and it teaches analyzing a problem and breaking it into pieces and seeing if you can organize those pieces to get a product. Uh, there's three levels here. One, you can play with the machine and see what it does. And one of them, you can build something. I'll go to three because that'll explain the whole thing a little faster. So I'll go to three. And it says, would I like an easy, medium, or hard? You want to choose? OK, easy. OK. okay. And it says, here's a product. See if you can make this product. OK, so you have to look at that and think about it. And it gives you eight steps you can do. Well, the first thing I might want to do is stripe it, mm -hmm. because there's a stripe there. And so I'll go over here to stripe. And I don't know if that's thin, medium, or thick. So we'll guess that it might be medium. Okay. And so there's a machine up in the corner. And now I want to rotate it. And if it started striping across this way, I've got to rotate it all the way around to there, so that might be 135 degrees, which is good for teaching uh, angles. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to 135. And now I think I'm done. OK, and so you so can now run the So I can say factory. done. And it'll, it'll run mine through. And if it matches, it'll tell me. Well, I'll see it. And you could have punched okay, my stripe's too wide. So, my product yeah. has a flaw because I had a big stri uh, medium stripe yeah. and it was a thin stripe. Now, we have just a little bit of time left. Uh, quickly, now where would this fit into the curriculum? What, what well, course? we use it in mathematics sometimes as a as an enrichment, and I teach a class called problem solving at Crocker, where the students take classes and we learn to solve all kinds of different problems. Okay, one quick there. last question to the both of you. Quick answers. Does every kid in school need a computer at home? No. I don't think 70 percent so. of my students have computers at home. One percent of mine have them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need them, but yeah, it, it always helps because idea. you can take your work home that way. And... Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry we don't have any more time. It's a fascinating subject. Well, we're going to be back next week with more about educational software, the use of educational software out of the schools for personal use and so on. So make sure you're with us again next week on Chronicles, and I'll be back in just a minute with this week's random access file. In the random access file this week, Compaq officially unveiled its new 386 Desk Pro computer using the Intel 8386 chip. The new 386 will come in two models, the Model 40 featuring a 40 megabyte hard drive and the Model 130 with a 130 megabyte drive. Compaq says the new 386 can run most software two to three times faster than an AT. The 32-bit computer runs at 16 megahertz, can execute some two million instructions per second, and comes with one million bytes of internal RAM. Compaq says the 386 is compatible with most all current major 
major software packages. Compaq also announced that it will be coming out with a Microsoft Xenix 5 operating system in early 1987. In bringing out the new generation 386 computer, Compaq moved ahead of IBM, which has still not announced its plans for a 386 computer. Indeed, there were rumors last week that IBM had planned to announce a whole new line of PCs this month, but ran into problems and had to cancel the unveiling at the last minute. In the aftermath of the first big desktop publishing conference last week, it appears that the Macintosh may be losing its edge in the DTP market. More than a dozen new desktop publishing programs were introduced for PC compatibles, and about half the exhibitors at the DTP conference were showing products for MS-DOS machines. There were several pronouncements on the future health of the computer industry this past week, but few of them agreed. At the Computer Futures Conference in New York, analysts said there is little hope for a rebound from the computer industry slump in the near future. McGraw-Hill, meanwhile, said second quarter figures show the industry is slowly breaking out of the slump, with sales and profits up from last year. But then Standard & Poor said it's forecasting a prolonged electronics recession and predicted it'll have to continue to downgrade the debt ratings of high-tech companies. Let's turn now to software in this week's review with Paul Schindler. If you don't use a thesaurus, you won't find much use for WordFinder. But if you'd like to say exactly what you mean with the best words possible, you might want to check out a memory resident program which leads the thesaurus derby, WordFinder. It contains 220,000 synonyms in its latest version. Now, it also works with virtually every word processor you ever heard of and several that you haven't heard of. Not only is WordFinder gigantic, it's also fast. If you don't like the control key which brings WordFinder into action, you can change it. But WordFinder picks a likely key based on your word processor. All you do is point at a word. WordFinder looks up several synonyms. You pick one from the list, point at your choice, and it replaces the word in the text. If it's a verb or noun form, you have to change the form yourself, but that's not too bad. What is too bad is how hard it is to get out of WordFinder cleanly, and how difficult it is to remove it from memory. Because it involves an abnormal exit, WordFinder causes some word processors to leave temporary files on your disks. But that's a small problem relative to good synonyms online. WordFinder costs $80 and comes from writing consultants in East Rochester, New York. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Tandy reports that the new 1000 EX computer is being held up by the FCC as Tandy awaits certification on radio frequency interference. The new 1000 XX just received FCC certification earlier this month. The Senate Judiciary Committee has approved the new Electronic Privacy Act, which protects computer communications. The bill now goes before the full Senate Judiciary Committee. And Senator William Cohen of Maine has introduced his Computer Matching Protection Bill, which would regulate computer matches by the federal government. Admiral Bobby Inman, former deputy director of the CIA, has announced he'll be leaving MCC. Inman says he wants to concentrate more on the manufacturing and marketing side of the industry. Apple is still hard at work trying to track down the source of recent new product leaks, like the one about the new 16-bit Apple II GS. Apple is now giving new products different code names so that when a story leaks, it can determine who leaked it by finding out what code name shows up in the story. Finally, a company named Hokey Hokey announced in Britain a new PC clone using the 8386 chip running MS-DOS 5.0 with 4 megabytes of RAM and a 70 megabyte hard disk, all for under $4,500. The story ran all over the British computer press until the managing director of Hokey Hokey announced it was all a hoaxy hoaxy. After all, he said the difference between fantasy and reality in the computer industry is fairly marginal anyway. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.